So yes, uh, my name is Aaron Myers. I am a geospatial systems architect in the geospatial sciences and human security division at Oak Ridge. Um, new new division name, so I'm still getting used to it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I want to talk about some of the research we're doing. Uh, make sure I'm on the right slide. There we go. Uh, so just to start off uh, with some acknowledgement, this is a the small group of people that helped me put these slides together. Uh, this is a percentage of the people that have contributed to the research I'm about to show. Um, but I did want to acknowledge the, the support and helping me get these slides. I'm not necessarily the expert in all of the things I'm going to be talking about today, but I will hopefully have enough background that I can answer your questions and uh, kind of give you a brief overview of some of the things we're doing with geospatial data and post GIS. So one of the cornerstones of the uh, human geospatial science and human security division um, at Oak Ridge is our land scan data. So land scan is a uh, gridded population data set. We have a global version, we have a USA version. Uh, the USA version um, has a daytime and nighttime population of about uh, 100 meter uh, resolution. We update that annually um, based on a lot of different data. Um, so basically, LandScan is a top down approach where we take census data, buildings data, roads, parcel information, take a bunch of these different data sets, and then we try to disaggregate them into probabilities of where people are at nighttime and where they are during the day. And so trying to disaggregate that that population to get the highest resolution uh, population we can for use in uh, emergency response, um, research and all sorts of things. Um, and LandScan USA has currently been made publicly available um, and the links there at the bottom of this slide uh, that we can make available that will I assume be made available. So one of the things we've done more recently with LandScan, uh, LandScan has been a uh, project that's been going on since the early 2000s. And so what was going on before is we were doing a lot of this work in vector, in a raster. Uh, so we would take all this vector data, convert it into rasters, do a bunch of raster algebra. Um, and as you can see, we've got you know, 12 million census polygons, 150 million parcels, and it just became a big data management problem. And so as we got kind of exposed to Postgres and PostGIS and different ways of doing things, and we started to reach some limitations with some of the bigger commercial products in actually dealing with all of this data. Uh, we started to explore kind of alternatives to the raster approach. So uh, beginning in uh, 2018, we started to transition to really dealing with the vector data kind of in its native format and working very hard to only convert it to a raster at the very end of all the the modeling and the processing. So we took all the data that we had in vector, we put it in a Postgres database, and we started to come up with ways to deal with it. So again, we're dealing with population. So one of the easiest ways to figure out where people are is to know where the buildings are. Um, so we did some, we've done some work to uh, create a, a buildings data set. And so what we've done with that is taken the, the kind of the, the grids or created a vector version um, of our LandScan USA grid, and then overlaid that with our buildings data set. And so now we can we split up the buildings based on um, all of, uh, based on the, the grid, and then we overlay all this ancillary data, the parcels, the census data, land use, everything we can. And so for each segment of that building, we can actually uh, get information about the different land use types, the the census blocks, everything we could possibly need to try to understand what's going on in that building and try to assign a population uh, to those, those building segments. And so that's what we're showing here is that we can actually, for all the buildings that we have data for in the US, uh, we can actually assign probabilities of, or estimates of, of population in each of those building segments based on everything we know about it. So that includes schools data, includes prisons, includes nursing homes and daycares. And so we can, it gives us a lot of flexibility to really understand uh, and try to model where uh, the population is. Um, so we can, we can kind of continue to tweak that. And it's a lot easier to update our data from year to year because we're not having to do a lot more of, of uh, the vector to raster conversion. 
making sure all the grid cells line up. So it gives us a lot more flexibility to add in new data, do different things. And it's actually increased, increased our processing time, improved our processing time uh, because we're only really doing a lot of that raster stuff right at the very end. Um, so another one, another, uh, so kind of quickly shifting gears um, into another geospatial application. So a lot of the work that we do um, is both the research side, so dealing with the land scan data, but then the, the kind of the flip side of that work is also taking that really interesting research data and applying it to real world problems and building web applications around it. So one of the web applications that we've built is the environment for analysis of geolocated energy information, what we call Eagle Eye. And so this is um, the primary tool that the Department of Energy uses for situational awareness around uh, utility customer data. So we collect utility outages from public, publicly available uh, utility websites every 15 minutes. And we're currently covering about 91% of the US customer population. So in these, in these images, uh, you can see Hurricane Zeta on the left um, and kind of its track through the Southeast. Uh, and then on the right, you can see Hurricane Laura and its track through uh, Texas and Louisiana um, earlier this year. And so we're using, um, the, for the counties and the, and the states, we're using post GIS to um, assign outages to different locations. So these different utilities report outages in a lot of different ways. Some of them will report by points, some of them by county, which is, makes our lives really easy. Some of them by zip codes. Um, zip codes, we are an interesting spatial animal. Um, we didn't really think that zip codes cross state boundaries. They do, quite a few of them. Uh, some of them cross huge parts of different states. And so trying to ensure that we can use that zip code data and assign the, 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 um, the outages to the right counties uh, has been a big challenge. And so you'll see down on the, on the left, I'm not sure if you can see my, my mouse there. Um, so this point is actually an outage point. And so you'll actually see it's way out in the middle of, of nowhere. And it's supposed to go to a county in New Mexico. And so we do a lot of work with PostGIS to, uh, for our point data and our polygon data to not just look at intersections, but looking at does it intersect the, does it, is it a true intersection? Does it intersect the envelope of that county? And if it doesn't do either of those things, we just do a spatial distance and say, what's the closest county within, you know, a few, a few miles uh, and try to assign it to that. And we have some checks to make sure we're not just being completely ridiculous and assigning it across state boundaries and different things. So that's one way that we're using PostGIS to assign our customer outages. And then we then use PostGIS to aggregate that data up into county data. So we're taking the points and the polygons and the zip codes, aggregating that up to county data, aggregate the counties up to states, and then up to the nation and FEMA regions and different things. Um, also within the Eagle Eye um, web application, there's a lot of critical infrastructure data. So your power plants, your substations, um, we have information about earthquakes. And so we have a, the ability within the web UI to um, kind of query against that critical infrastructure, um, especially if, there's a, if we have a path of a hurricane, we can tell you all of the critical infrastructure that's within the, uh, within the cone of uncertainty for the path of that hurricane to try to give our response, our responder community a lot better understanding of the things that they might need to be looking at um, in their response effort. So uh, again, using GeoServer and other uh, PostGIS intersection capabilities to pull that data and display it on the map. The final thing about Eagle that I'll talk about, um, so there's a lot of good reporting about utility customers at the state level, but there's not really good reporting about utility customers at the county level. So one of the things we've started doing recently is trying to model uh, that county customer data. And so this is where an intersection between land scan and Eagle Eye happens. So we have the land scan buildings. We know where their populations are. We, can, we know kind of the electric service boundaries and what utilities support those different boundaries. And so now we can start to do different intersections of of this different data to try to get a good estimate of how the state level data aggregates across the county information. 
And so this is just kind of a, so take the service areas, we spatially join that to our 250 billion Lansky and USA polygons. And then we take all of the, the information uh, from EIA, the Energy Information Association, and then the Eagle Eye data. So there, there are differences between what EIA reports and what's actually observed in reality. And so we kind of maintain an up-to-date version of the EIA data about what, util what counties and states at different utility covers. So we merge all of that information together. Um, and then we allow to do a lot, we, uh, Postgres allows us to do a lot of different testing and modeling and comparison to try to get the best um, representation of that county data. And that county data is really important um, for doing, for kind of representing outages to the end user, because we can, with the county data, we can actually provide uh, percent outages. And so um, before we could only do it based on counts. And so um, if you only had 500 people in a county, that would never show as a significantly impacted county if there were, even if there were 450 of those customers without or without power. And so we were now having this county data, we can bring a lot more fidelity and a lot more information to our responders to know that, no, yes, we need to be looking into this county because 90% of them don't have power. And so it gives us a lot better way of reporting information to the end users. Um, and then building on that, another web application um, that we've developed is the World Spatio-Temporal Mapping Project. Uh, WSTAMP is what we call it. Um, it is a online tool that has brought together a significant amount, 50 years, 200 million or 20 million records, uh, 20,000 attributes for global um, socioeconomic data. Um, so this is from World Bank, World Health Organization, uh, NATO. I think we're starting to bring in some different EIA, da EIA data. Uh, the CIA World Fact Book is, it was kind of the catalyst for the beginnings of this project. And so what this project allows us to do is to look at different trends and changes over time uh, between different countries, different regions, so that we might be able to do what if scenarios or ask questions about uh, the cause and effect of different, uh, different policies or different decisions. And so we can look at you know, different countries in South Africa and kind of understand when aid increases or when certain things increase, what might that impact? So in the past that's impacted violence or the environment in different ways. And so pro providing some different context for different decisions based on his historic data. So the challenge with that, as one might um, understand, is country boundaries and, and what, what, does it, what does the word country actually mean changes significantly over time. Um, so as countries have civil wars and they break up or they actually join back together, so you can think of, of Germany um, you know, as they, they, or they were two and then they are one. And how do we take all of that data and make a cohesive story about what Germany has been over the years and, and how we, we assign all of this data back to spatial entities has been a big challenge. And so PostGIS has played a, a critical role in allowing us to both manage, um, assign and, and store those bound the boundary information over time. And so we have, so actually as you're working through the tool, um, as you can see with Yugoslavia here, how it's kind of, it was Yugoslavia, now it's Croatia, Macedonia, and Slovenia. We can actually show you that transition of data and those countries over time. Um, because some data sets will actually go back and correct all of their data to the current meaning of the countries. And so they'll take Yugoslavia data and actually break it out into the, the, newer, the newer countries and others will keep it as just Yugoslavia. So we have to balance and manage all of those different country and administrative information so that we can tell a cohesive story and provide a good context for all of the different information. All right, so I'll uh, just gonna pause for a second. I feel like I'm going really, really fast. I got a question. Sorry. Says so the question was, um, you say the vector computation is a lot faster than the raster one. 
Did you also use PostGIS for raster calculations, or what did you, or what did your old solution solution look like? Um, so yeah, we have found that the uh, PostGIS calculations are faster, um, and part of that is probably just technology. A lot of the older solutions were written in um, old Esri workflows um, back in ArcGIS 3.1 and different things. Um, and um, that way, and so, so part of it is just technology has improved. So there is some improvements, but dealing with larger and larger data sets. So as we started to introduce parcels, uh, parcel data and uh, bigger point data sets, the buildings data themselves, um, just dealing with those as, as vectors was a lot faster to do as vector as opposed to trying to convert it to raster. Just that conversion process of all of those building footprints into rasters uh, took several days, um, depending on your calculations. And we could do that significantly faster in, in uh, PostGIS and not actually have to worry about any of those conversions until we we're at the very end. Okay. I kind of uh, just one observation on that. You know, when I used to teach GIS, we had that saying of ra raster is faster, but vector is better. Right? <laughs> and it's, it's really funny at this day and age to hear that almost turned on its head. I mean, you get so much better data resolution. Like those houses, you you had the potential to have a house not even show up if it just yep. hit exactly on raster boundaries, right? So exactly. Yeah, it's amazing that that was. That's the solution is to go to vector, which everybody yep. like, no way, that's going to be worse. <laughs> really? Like yeah. It. Yeah. Okay. And, so then, and a big part of it for us was also just we ended up having to store the data three or four times because we were storing the intermediate parts and different things. And we could ended up just being able to store it once. You store all this vector, you at you basically were have a big master table and we just add the attributes that we need to to that build those building segments and then you, you kind of do the, the post-processing at the end and we can do a little more iterative work with it um, because we can, we can kind of manipulate it a little bit quicker. And it also allows us to bring it into cool, cool tools like QGIS and kind of see some of those things a little more dynamically than we could just looking at a cell. You know, you can actually see different things. Um, any issues with doing PG overlay operations? I cannot answer that question, um, but I can find out someone who can. Um, I know that uh, one of the researchers, Jessica, that did a lot of the conversion to post GIS for, for the land scan work was very, and she didn't get to see the PG overlay talk earlier today. And that's something that she was very interested in looking at to see if that might be a, something that would be a benefit to us moving forward. Any other questions while we got on a little break right here? All right, uh, feel free to ask in the, I have the QA, up, the QA panel up on my screen. I think I'll see a raised hand potentially, um, but feel free to kind of ask as I go and we'll definitely have, I think plenty of time here at the end to, to wrap things up. Um, so kind of continuing on with our, uh, with our with our different research um, efforts, um, another research effort that we have is called Planet Sense. Uh, Planet Sense is uh, Planet Sense Palatial. Um, it's a new one for me. Um, is really looking at global volunteer geographic information platform that is really looking at points of interest um, across the world, and so kind of using different social media feeds and information. Um, and, and open source data to try to build up a knowledge base of places and semantic relationships between these different things, um, just to provide different context to, um, to, to different researchers that are looking at information um, around the world and, and trying to provide additional context about things that they're looking at. So really, it's really a uh, this is plant sense is really looking at a, it from kind of a big data problem 
doing natural language processing, doing a lot of geolocating. So basically taking these social media information, these different data collections from all of these sources and trying to build them into um, a big data set using machine learning and a lot of distributed computing. And so really using PostGIS to be the, the foundation of the spatial aspects of this data. And so a big challenge with this is a lot of the social media information that we're working with um, hasn't been, or doesn't often have the, the geolocations. And so we're deriving that in different ways where we're looking specifically at, at different venues and different things. Um, we are trying to kind of build up this capability to, uh, to mine uh, and harvest a, a, a large amount of data and then provide the relevant spatial information back to, to our end users. Ooh, that's a good question. So regarding PlanetSense crowdsourced data, what are all the many thousands of points shown for Antarctica on the slide shown? It's a great question and I wish I had an answer for it. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but I will uh, try to make a point to find out exactly what it is. I had the same question and I forgot to get that answer before I uh, presented today. Um, I think it actually is flooding by the whales. You know, they like to hang out. In <laughs> That's probably true. They're, 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 pretty active on, they're pretty active on social media from yeah, what I hear. I think it's the, the, pe the penguins. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that, it's interesting. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be just, uh, just a point density thing of, of where things on this might, there might just be some air and that might just, I'm not exactly sure what the, what they're showing in, in that particular graphic. Um, so um, basically, this is just a little bit of slide about their 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 architecture. Um, so we try, we're we're processing about two gigs of data per second, uh, two terabytes of ground photos a day. Um, so doing a lot of data processing, and then again trying to put all of that information on the Earth somewhere, uh, and somewhere that makes sense, and somewhere that that is useful to to the researchers and the end users of the Planet Sense capability. Um, and so again, trying to use open source platforms and doing a lot of stuff through GeoServer, Postgres, PostGIS to do spatial analysis and, and put things where they're supposed to be. Uh, PlanetSense is, is partially openly available. Um, we can make the data available um, for specific research efforts. Um, and I think it's, um, it's, it is behind a username and password, um, but it's something that, that we can share because it is all derived from open sources and I can get you that connection information. So the next um, project I'll talk about um, is kind of the inverse of, of LandScan. So LandScan is that top-down approach where we're taking kind of the, the high level data of counties and or censuses and uh, buildings and points and and trying to disaggregate that out. So plant, uh, I mean, pop, uh, PDT, the population density tables is the inverse of that. We're looking at specific facility level information and trying to derive a, an estimate of people per thousand square feet in that type of facility or that specific facility, uh, facility type. Um, so we're looking at uh, religious places, so churches and mosques and synagogues, and uh, we're looking at schools, all the different kinds of schools. Uh, we're looking at homes, um, and we're doing all this. We're doing this all, all around the world, um, and a lot of this is actually done from open sources and through man manual data entry, and so we're actually going out to web pages and images and, and any data set, and we actually have um, a team of a team of data miners, I'll call them, that go in and they're looking at different regions or trying to answer different questions. And they're trying to build up this base knowledge of understanding of patterns and uh, building types and facilities um, around the world. And so trying to then apply a Bayesian statistical model to that to um, try to derive, do we know enough about this information that we can uh, give good estimates about the, the probability of, of density within a given facility and to try to understand a little bit better about the 
kind of the, the daily patterns um, of, of buildings and, and things in these different regions based on different cultural um, information. And so then again, similar to um, the World Stamp Project, we're really dealing with, with country data over time. So PDT actually goes down to the administrative level fours and fives, so really down below the county into the, the census blocks and the, the, the tracks and the different things. And so we basically have all, spend a, a bunch of time and then spend a bunch of effort trying to maintain that spatial information to look at, okay, we've got a new administrative boundary in a place and how do we, is that, should that be above the one we currently have or should it be below it? Does it, you know, what are the intersections? So we're doing a lot of work looking at kind of what percentage of this boundary covers, covers another one to try to make determinations of where it falls in a hierarchy of administrative boundaries. And then, and then to update all of the data associated with those boundaries to try to um, associate it with the lowest level boundary uh, that we possibly can. So doing a lot of intersections and unions and splits to try to understand what's the best representation of this data. Um, the digital nautical charts project is one that's really new to me. So we're trying to basically come up with an integrated database uh, system for uh, converting nautical charts from one format to another. So looking at different uh, different data and trying to use Postgres, PostGIS, and QGIS uh, to manually work through this different nautical chart information and to try to come up with the best approach for um, converting this data into matching up these this different nautical chart informations with their appropriate locations on Earth. And the final one I'll talk about tonight um, is actually PostGIS for imagery management. So um, at OML, we've got a lot of, we've got tons and tons of imagery. And we had looked at a lot of different um, solutions for how to manage and track and basically serve internally uh, to, to LandScan and PDT and other projects, uh, just this vast amount of imagery information. And what we actually found was the best, the best solution for us anyway, was to kind of build a homegrown uh, image management system. So just using Python, um, GDAL, and a Postgres, PostGS database, we have a system that crawls through our two and a half petabytes of data um, on a daily basis um, to update all the metadata all the information associated with any imagery so that whenever we get new imagery in uh, we can actually always have an accurate representation of where that uh, what that imagery is and so basically what you're seeing here just the the footprints um, for every image that we have and you can click on one you can find out where can i go get it what was the sensor uh, what's the cell, si cell size you can find a lot of information. So basically we're mining all of that metadata, building up these image footprints and being able to serve that internally uh, to, to our different researchers so that there's not a, a question about where I need to go look for, for imagery or um, I'm trying to find something in this particular area. They can load it into their GIS tools and, and point at it uh, to, uh, to go get all that information. And it's actually, uh, we were able to crawl most of that data in a few hours. Um, so I think the first pass takes a day or so, but then the, the subsequent updates are, are quite a bit faster. Um, I've, actually the best person, if you wanna, if uh, so the question is who's is the best person to contact to get any of your organiz organization's geo data, if it can be shared, um, I will, give you my email address and I can be the, the initial point of contact for, um, for, for pointing you in the right direction if you have any questions um, about our data. Um, a lot of our data is on the, or, so we maintain a lot of 
uh, data on the Homeland in Infrastructure Foundation level data, the Highfeld data set, uh, so for critical infrastructure. Um, but if you also go to um, ORL.gov or look up um, the Geoscience, Geospatial Science and Human Security Division, um, our website should be able to point you towards um, much of the data that we produce. Um, and said, you can contact me at myersat, M-Y-E-R-S-A-T at ORNL.gov, ORNL.gov, if you have any questions. And with that, I'll open it up to further questions. Thanks a lot, Aaron. That was a, I mean, that was such a, was exactly what I was hoping for, like such a list of ways in which like PostGIS is just the bread and butter for some really interesting and huge projects. I mean, that's what I kind of get out of it. Is that kind of, was that kind of the point? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we really adopt. So when I first started working at the lab back in 2008, uh, we were kind of having that, you know, it's kind of the MySQL Postgres conversation. And and we, we jumped in pretty hard on the Postgres, PostGIS stuff and really haven't looked back. Um, so it started out kind of on the smaller on the smaller end, really towards our web applications. But as we've grown in our understanding of its capabilities and what it can do, we've really started to spread it out into our research applications uh, much more significantly. Um, it's been a very organic thing. I think we still have a ways to go to get a broader adoption. That's something we're working very hard to kind of take this knowledge that we've gained in the past several years of applying post GIS to different problems um, and how it's been beneficial and, and providing kind of new ways to, to look at at these these problems that you know again might have traditionally been solved in one way or using one technology and how something like post GIS can come and and provide a different solution, maybe provide some some better gains and, and kind of looking at the problem differently. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, so since you're the last one I get to ask, you get to have some fun questions also. Like if you could ask one thing of the PostGIS developers that would be, a, or one a couple things, or what would you really love to see in PostGIS that would make your life better? Ooh, 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 ooh. That's a great question. If I have to ask anything, Mm -hmm. Post GIS. Anything post GIS related that will make your life better. I mean, they can <laughs> a lot of cash or something like that. But you know, I think the big thing that we're that make that continues to make our life better from post GIS, and I think the the folk is just that it's that performance improvement. It's that every time we get a, that post GIS takes a step forward, it, it seems like. So it's not really a, I think it's just a continue on that path is mm -hmm. I think the, you know, the, it, we've, we've got a benefit, like the new functions are great. We always get some benefit out of, of something new. Um, and so I'm sure with some of the talks earlier, we'll get something new, but that, that speed improvement, that just the base level we've, we've made just the, some of the basics better. Um, and that's sex like unions, those sorts of things. Like those are the things that we use all the time and they seem very simple, but we do them, you know, we do an intersect for every building in the, in the U.S. for five, you know, for 50 different attributes. And so we're intersecting all of the spatial data. And so I think continuously to make that the focus would be kind of the, and how we can, is there anything we can do to make it even faster um, would be the things that I would be interested in having discussions about. Sure. And that's, um, that's the thing that Paul likes to, Paul, you know, Paul said post GIS for the for the win and for the web, right? I mean, one of the things he likes to say about that is if when they improve performance, you just and you update, you automatically get it, right? You didn't yep. have to change your code. You didn't just like, oh, I'm still running, but I'm 30% faster now. That's awesome. Yeah, yep. like those those things really we see a big benefit from. And so I think that would be, you know, if I was to, to talk about things that I would want to see, that would be one of the things I would want to continue to see. And I'm sure it's always the focus because that's what we're all striving for. But yeah. um, that's always beneficial to us. Learning the new things helps in several cases, but that's always the thing that we just, yep, we should just, up, uh, just upgrade it because we know it's going to be a little bit faster and it's going to help us do things a little bit quicker. Working with Martin, I'm going to tell you, I think his... Oh, new overlay ng is going to be in 3.1. Um, there will be a, 
quite a bit of speed improvements for some of those overlay operations that you're doing. Yeah. Yep. So that's, yeah, it says we're, we're very interested in that stuff that's coming out as well. Yeah. So we got a question from Mohammed. Mohammed said, do you guys have a parcel cadastre data layer for the US? In other words, do you have the Holy Grail? We do not. <laughs> we uh, so again with all with a lot of that the land scan stuff. It, it's kind of we we work a lot with what we have where we have it. So we do we have purchased some parcel data that I don't think covers the entire U.S. And so it's kind of we have a lot of rules about if not parcels, then use this. And so it kind of we kind of go down that that kind of resolution tree. And I might, I might have a better answer here in just a second. Uh, and a lot of that parcel data is also in Highfeld, is what I'm being told. Um, so yeah, so it's it's we do not have the holy grail. We are trying to derive the best answer we can from the data we have where we have it. Yeah. And so in some of the the, the data sparse uh, areas of the U.S., it very much is doing the best we have with what we have. And so it might end up falling back on land uh, land cover data. And right. so which which everyone has a slightly different interpretation of what those things mean. Um, so that's, those are the types of things that we, we use just what we have, where we have it. Right. I mean, some of it's like what Randy talked about earlier today. Like everybody's got a different set of data that they use for E911 because not everybody, there's not a, there wasn't really a standard, a national standard when they started doing it. And so yeah. I would imagine like integrating part, even if you could go to every single county, counties download GIS download site and get all their parcel data. It's a Herculean effort to homogenize all that and get it to standardized and together. I mean, it's just a lot. Yeah. And it is worth asking Mohammed because everybody wants it and we should just keep <laughs> asking. Um, yep. So I think with that, I think we'll wrap up the day.